Namaste. Well, here it is Sunday morning, and last night our neighbors decided that we're getting way too much sleep, so they had a party and were playing bad taste of music until, I don't know, one or two in the morning. So we're all kind of bah humbug this morning. But anyway, <laughs> we're drunken rascals. Um, we're going to continue with the, with the karika, the commentary on the Mandukya Upanishad, Shloka 40. Manaso nigrahayatam abhayam sarva yoginam dukakshaya prabodhascha pyakshaya shantirevacha. The yogis who do not follow the method of jnana yoga as described in this karika depend on control of their mind for fearlessness, destruction of misery, knowledge of self, and eternal peace. So if you have any experience in yoga, or any real experience, you know that this is already, the, these guys are in trouble. Because trying to control the mind, Arjuna says in Bhagavad Gita, is harder than controlling the wind. You know, just think of it. The wind is blowing everywhere. You can't stop it. It's a force of nature. It's more powerful than you, and so is the mind. You know, just try it. Sit down and try to stop the mind. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Well, the mind is there for a reason. Nature creates the mind to protect the body and to come up with an alarm if anything threatening occurs. Of course, the mind was developed to exist in nature. We exist in an artificial society with so many symbolic dangers rather than real dangers. But the body still reacts the same way to them, as if, you know, there were tigers out there. <laughs> but it's mostly just about money and power and society and what people think and all this symbolic stuff. So anyway, the mind is impossible to control. Don't waste your time. Well, then you might ask, how do we get beyond the mind? How do we go beyond this Agnya Chakra to the higher chakras? Sushupti and uh, Turiya. See? And the way to do this, of course, is by interest and attention. This is why I always say you must practice karma and bhakti yoga before attempting meditation. Because the mind is naturally attracted by pleasure. The mind is naturally uh, peaceful when there is no danger. So if you have cleaned up your karma through karma yoga, the performance of auspicious ritualistic activities as given in the shastras, then you have no physical fears, no anxieties. Uh, you're in good health. You have plenty of money. Uh, you have good friends. You have a stable, peaceful, safe situation in the world. You don't have to worry about that. Now, the next thing is quality of relationship. And that's what bhakti yoga is all about. We're going through the story of Sandhya, in the Shiva Purana. And in this story, this, it doesn't matter whether it's factual, historical, or a legend, so-called so legend. Huh? It doesn't matter. 
What matters is that there are plenty of noble, high thoughts in this story. There are plenty of ideas that reflect spiritual values. I remember one time when I had just joined ISKCON and I was reading Srimad Bhagavatam for the first time. And uh, I was trying to talk to someone. I forget who it was. I think it might have been one of my old musician friends. And explain to them why I, what I was doing and why. And they were saying, you know, why did you give up being a musician and just and join this cult? And I'm going, oh, and they were saying, how do you know that these scriptures aren't just made up? And I told them it doesn't matter. Even if they're just made up stories, the point is they have such noble values. They propagate such high ideals and ideas. And they raise very interesting questions about the origin of the universe, how it was created, the, the level of intelligence that goes into the design of the universe, and so on. So in other words, bhakti, remember bhakti is the evolution or development of svapna consciousness. Svapna means dreams. And so the mind, is, it's been found by sleep researchers in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. Dreams are the mind's way of healing itself and understanding what is happening in the world around it. Without dreams, we gradually go crazy. Like, this is one reason why pot smokers are so weird, you know? Because marijuana, THC, uh, affects dreaming. And it makes us actually dream while we're awake. Anyway, more than we usually do. <laughs> So, in other words, it increases imagination, which also increases creativity and so many. And that's why so many artists smoke pot. I did. I smoked pot for years when I was a jazz musician, professional composer and so on. But ultimately, of course, if you're serious about your sadhana, you have to give it up. So anyway, the point is dreams are important for mental health whether we have them while asleep or while awake. And the whole point of bhakti yoga, or the way it works, and why it works, is that it cultivates and develops beautiful dreams of high concepts, of high spiritual values, beautiful thoughts, beautiful ideas. And we need this. I think society today is in so much trouble because people have stopped dreaming beautiful dreams. They've stopped having and cultivating beautiful thoughts. This so-called scientific reductionism and materialism. Uh, I, I remember being in school and being told when I was like looking off, uh, you know, out the window and daydreaming during some boring math lesson or something, that this is just in your head. This is just in your mind. In other words, it's not important. It doesn't matter. Oh, but it does. It does. A society that loses its dreams is in serious trouble. And the same goes for an individual. If you lose your dream, if you lose your guiding star, how do you navigate in the world of the mind? How do you keep yourself from falling into negativity and depression? And the answer, of course, is you can't. You can't. So dreaming is part of the mind's natural system for maintaining its health, its positivity, its optimistic outlook. You must have a dream, even if it's impossible, huh? What was that song about? The impossible dream. <laughs> so one must have a dream. And this is 
Bhakti yoga, the most beautiful dreams, the most beautiful thoughts, then only can you go beyond the mind. Once the mind is healthy and the body is healthy through karma yoga, by means of bhakti, natural concentration of the mind takes place on these beautiful thoughts because the mind is attracted by pleasure. It's repelled by fear. And that's why most of us can't meditate worth a darn <laughs> because we're always worrying about stuff, isn't it? So, you know, I could write a book, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Transcend My Mind. <laughs> and it's through bhakti. So everyone should have their own private dreams or fantasies about their relationship with God in any form. These are metaphors. They're metaphors for a level of existence, a way of being. Like Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, the, the type of being that you remember at the time of death determines your next body. So, in other words, these dreams, these thoughts, if cultivated throughout the entire life, lead to remembering a state of being at the time of death that leads to a higher level of embodiment, a higher level of intelligence, a higher level of pleasure in life, and so on. So one perceives the world through the quality of the senses. And if the senses are degraded, if the mind is degraded, mind is one of the senses, then the whole quality of life suffers. So the way to get the mind under control is not by brute force, that like the yogis try to do. Uh, if you read Patanjali Yoga Sutras, he talks about concentration. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> lots of luck with that process. Because you'll find the mind likes to jump out of any control you put on it. Anytime it finds itself uh, in a cage, in a box, under discipline, being controlled, it likes to jump out like a monkey. Huh? It's very hard to control a monkey. Very difficult. Anytime you try to enclose them, uh, they're very fast. They can jump out before you get the door closed. <laughs> And the same with the mind. The mind, in fact, Buddha, when he was talking about meditation, said the body is a better platform than the mind because the mind is so unstable, I can't even find a metaphor to illustrate it. And of course, the Buddha was a master of metaphors, but he couldn't find a metaphor that suits how unstable the mind is. So the only way to attract the mind, just like the only way to attract a monkey, is with the bait of fruits. Huh? That's how monkeys get trapped. In Thailand, they have monkey traps where they put some fruits inside a basket. And the basket has one hole that's big enough for the monkey to get his hand in, but not big enough for him to take it out when he's, once he's grabbed a fruit. And that's how they catch monkeys. <laughs> So in the same way, the mind can be caught by pleasure, by performance of bhakti. And then meditation becomes possible because one's interior being cleansed by practice of karma and bhakti yoga becomes so beautiful and so interesting and so pleasurable that the mind naturally feels at home and can relax. And this, I don't know how much this is worth, you know. I, isn't it? I give you everything I got just for a little peace of mind. It's the Beatles song. Give you everything I got just for a little peace of mind. So peace of mind is the most valuable thing because it leads to authentic meditation. Authentic meditation means emptiness, nothingness infinite space and that spontaneously leads to infinite consciousness because who is it that's aware of all that space 
a space that's so big that the whole material world simply shrinks into insignificance. And that leads to the spontaneous revelation of the self, Brahman, and that is the goal of self-realization. Aung Tat Sat, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya,